Okay, everyone. So Eileen O'Finlan writes historical fiction, telling the stories on history's margins, the things rarely taught in the classroom. For her, that's where history really gets fun. Her promise to her readers is to craft stories that will thoroughly immerse them in another time and place. Eileen holds a bachelor's degree in history and a master's degree in pastoral ministry. She works full time for the Diocese of Worcester and teaches online courses for the University of Dayton, Ohio. Erin's Children is her second novel and the sequel to her debut novel, Kelly Geen. So Eileen, I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you for that introduction. And I would also like to thank Jennifer Marion, along with uh, Tara and the whole Worcester Public Library for inviting me to offer this talk. Erin's um, Children, the sequel to my debut novel, Caligine, was released on December 1st, 2020. And because of COVID, I've only been able to get out and do one other author talk. And that was last month at a bookstore in Bellows Falls, Vermont. So this is a treat for me. Um, as you may be aware, Erin's Children is set in Worcester in the 1850s, and it's the sequel to Kelligine. And this is Kelligine. Kelligine is set in Ireland uh, during Angorta Moor, or the Great Hunger. Most commonly, uh, it's referred to as the Irish Potato Famine, well, at least outside of Ireland. Uh, the Irish don't call it that because it technically wasn't a famine. Um, potatoes were the only crop that failed and there was plenty of food in Ireland, but the majority of the Irish had no access to it. They lived on mostly, uh, pretty much nothing but potatoes. So when that crop failed completely due to blight several years in a row, the people starved. And the English government who were pretty much running the show at the time, uh, felt that the devastating starvation, which resulted in about a million deaths through starvation and the accompanying disease, and about another other, uh, a million people emigrating um, to other countries was actually beneficial to them because um, they it, it opened up a lot of land in Ireland for them to settle on and to graze their cattle on. So they weren't in any hurry to put an end to the starvation, um, at least not until the rest of the world got wind of it and started sending assistance and condemning the British government for their failure to help. And Kelligine tells the story of a handful of characters living in a small fictional town called Kelligine. Um, and is, as it was true for a great many real Irish people at the time, um, a few of the characters leave Ireland for America. And that's where Erin's Children picks up. So at first, I thought I would set Erin's Children in Boston. I figured a lot of Irish settled in Boston and it's only about an hour or so away from where I live. So I figured I could get there easily and do research. And then I spoke with a gentleman who worked for the Catholic Free Press when I worked for the Diocese of Worcester. So we're in the same building. And we were talking about my plans for the sequel. And he mentioned that there was a sizable Irish community in Worcester at the time. They came over with the first wave of Irish immigration in the 1830s. They actually are the ones who built the Erie Canal and then they came to Worcester and they built the Blackstone Canal. So because there was an Irish community already here, um, Worcester was a destination for a famine era Irish. So once I learned that, I decided I just had to set the story in Worcester. And fortunately, this uh, same person knew of some great books on the subject and one of which was a book called Inventing Irish America. It doesn't have anything on the cover, so I'll just show you this fine. But um, this is written by a man named Timothy J. And I believe the last name is pronounced Maha. It's M-E-A-G-H-E-R, which I would say meager, but I think it is Maha. Um, and that, this, that book uh, uses Worcester as an example to describe the lives of Irish immigrants in America. So once I read that book, I was totally sold on the idea of setting the novel in Worcester because I knew it was a legitimate destination for my characters. I also thought correctly that I would really enjoy researching Worcester's history in the 1850s and incorporating it into the story. The first wave of Irish immigrants to Worcester became known as the pioneer Irish. That was those ones that came over that built the Blackstone. Um, the next wave, those depicted in Erin's children, are called famine Irish. And it was the pioneer Irish 
who built St. John's Church. Um, St. John's was completed in 1846, which is about two years before Worcester was incorporated as a city. And it's at St. John's Church that the Irish characters in Aaron's Children worship. At that time, Father Matthew Gibson was pastor. Um, he was later succeeded by Father John Boyce, who was originally his um, associate pastor and then became pastor when Father Gibson moved on. So both of these priests make an appearance in Aaron's Children. It's a small appearance, but they're there. Um, what I know of these two priests came, comes from a, a book called To Preserve the, Pl the, sorry, to preserve the Flame, St. John's Parish and 150 Years of Catholicism in Worcester. And that's written by the same gentleman who wrote Inventing Irish America. Unfortunately for Father Gibson, he was not very well liked by the famine Irish. It seems to be because the pioneer Irish and the famine Irish didn't always get along all that well. And Father Gibson tended to side with the pioneer Irish. Um, and the fact that he came from England didn't help either. Uh, but Father Boyce being from Ireland uh, was much better accepted. Well, they were happier with him. Um, my research took me to the Worcester Historical Museum, where I learned of Worcester's industry, railroads, hotels, and all sorts of things that were going on in Worcester at the time. I found that it was a center of reform movements from abolition to women's rights. Um, in fact, a noted abolitionist, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who lived in Worcester in the 1850s, called Worcester a seething center for all reforms. So, and eventually through this, I learned of a riot that took place in Worcester uh, when a United States federal marshal named Asa Butman arrived in the city. And it was assumed that he was there to round up escaped slaves. He said he was there because he was looking for people who'd taken part in a riot that had occurred in Boston um, a few months be pr prior to that, is he arrived around Halloween, that, that one happened in May, and he claimed that that's what he was looking for, but the uh, people in Worcester didn't believe him. Um, and even though the Fugitive Slave Act was in force at the time, Worcester's abolitionists were having nothing to do with it, and they considered what he was doing kidnapping, so they rioted, and they actually drove him out of the city, making him promise never to return, and considering the way he what they did with him, I don't think he would have been in any hurry to return. But anyway, that incident is depicted in Aaron's Children exactly as the newspaper accounts of the day described it. I learned that Worcester had an iron foundry and a machine shop, and it was owned by William A. Wheeler, and it produced iron and brass castings for tool makers. They produced things like plow castings and safes and stoves, fireproof doors. In fact, the um, the architectural elements on the facade of Mechanics Hall, they were all cast of iron that was made at that foundry. So knowing that Worcester had a thriving iron foundry, I made the employers of my main characters co-owners of a foundry. So it's not, they're not, it's not William Wheeler, he's not in the story, but knowing that there was such a thing there, I had the, um, the two gentlemen in my story who employ my main characters, Meg and Kathleen, as domestic servants, that's what they do. That's why they are able to afford having ser um, domestic servants for their families. They co-own this thriving foundry. And I learned about the many railroad lines that came through Worcester. So the railroads become a part of everyday life for the characters in Aaron's children, as they were for real citizens of Worcester. In fact, Worcester was such a hub of railroad networks that by the 1840s, it had earned the nickname, the Chicago of New England. Um, and as sometimes happens when one is doing research, I found out about something very interesting quite by accident. While I was at the Worcester Historical Museum the second time, I spent a few minutes just going through the um, gift shop, just browsing, and I came across a book with a very intriguing title. It was called Worcester's Forgotten Catacombs. It was by Charles Longway Sr. And I would hold up a copy for you, except that I loaned my copy out and I haven't gotten it back yet. Uh, but it's a very interesting book. Uh, I was uh, uh, drawn to it because, uh, because of the word catacombs in the title, it caught my eye. I've always been fascinated with catacombs, but I always thought of them as being these ancient structures under the streets of Rome or, or France or something. And uh, I didn't expect to find them in Worcester. 
So flipping through the book, I saw that Mr. Longway had been a civil engineer for Worcester and had spent a bit of time under the city streets. His book documents the catacombs with their tunnels, brickwork, and archways, and includes diagrams, blueprints, and photographs. And it also offers the theories of when and why they were built and what they'd been used for. After purchasing and reading the book, I decided it was just way too cool not to put it in the story. And fortunately for me, uh, according to the author, the catacombs were supposedly in use in the 1850s, so it fit with the time period. And I gave them the uses attributed to them by newspaper articles from the 1930s that claimed them to have been part of the Underground Railroad, as well as the site of illegal gambling and bare knuckles boxing. Um, another fascinating part of my research was taking a walking tour of the Crown Hill area, to a historical district in Worcester. Um, after consulting with Cindy Chenette, a fellow writer and who also happens to be the librarian at Clark University and a docent for Preservation Worcester, um, I was talking to her, she's part of my writing workshop, and I was talking to her about where am I going to have, um, where in Worcester should I be having these, these domestic servants work. And she suggested the Crown Hill area. So um, that wasn't the only area in Worcester that employ, employed um, domestic servants, um, but it was an interest area that I found interesting, so I decided to go with it. And since Cindy does walking tours of Crown Hill area for Preservation Worcester, she knows it well and was kind enough to give me a private tour. And I loved being able to walk the streets and see the homes where I would be placing Megan and Kathleen. And besides that, there was this incredibly generous uh, gentleman who resides in Crown Hill, who on a later date uh, allowed Cindy and me to tour his home, uh, which is still very much as it was when it was built in the 1850s. It wasn't just a quick walkthrough either. He, he, did, he spent about two hours going through every room and telling us all about the, uh, the, the different things there, like the old fireplaces and the uh, the gaslight fixtures. It was just fascinating. I was I was so enthralled. I, I turned the house, that particular house, into a home for one of the other characters in Erin's Children. Uh, the Irish characters in Erin's Children, who are not domestic servants, lived where non-domestics lived in the 1850s, which was mostly on the east side of the city and on a section called the island. So Pine Street, in the story, that's what it was the name of the street in the 1850s. Today, it's Shrewsbury Street. And at that time, it was predominantly an Irish neighborhood in the 1850s. And it, it was a section known as the Meadows. And the island um, was that same general area. And it, it's a, it was a small island that was created by the Blackstone Canal. So two of my characters, Ava O'Sullivan and her mother, uh, who live and work in that area, they work in a, a factory where they sewed leather for boots and shoes. And this is exactly what was being done in a factory in Worcester. And it was in that factory, uh, which was part of a group of mills and, and uh, factories and businesses that was known as the Merrifield buildings or the Merrifield con complex. Um, and that's where one of the sewing machines really did overheat and the entire Merrifield uh, complex burned to the ground. It put about 500 people out of work. Uh, fortunately, no one was killed. There were some minor injuries, but um, the, the main thing was that all the buildings were burned to the ground and they, you know, like I said, about 500 people lost their jobs. Um, so that did happen. Um, and then Cindy, Cindy Jeanette again came to my assistance because she loaned me Clark University's bound copies of the annual reports for the city of Worcester for the entire decade of the 1850s. So each year had reports from the mayor, including his inaugural address, and reports from all the city boards and committees, including the school board, the aqueduct committee, committee for Hope Cemetery, the DPW, fire and police departments, and so on. Um, I Had I not been doing research for a novel, well, if I wasn't doing research for this novel, I'm not sure why I would have been reading those uh, documents, but <laughs> Uh, if I hadn't been doing it, I think I might have thought of those documents as a, a perfect cure for insomnia. But given my reason for reading them, I found them utterly fascinating. And they had not only contained information about, say, like how many schools Worcester had or what streets were be con being constructed when or how many fires there were and so on. They also told me other things like about the year 
believe it was 1851, um, where winter came early and it stayed. And it caused a shortage of some foods due to nearby farms not being able to finish their growing and harvesting. And though people who worked outdoors for a living, um, at least during the, the time of year when you could, they suddenly found themselves out of employment for a while, uh, a lot earlier than they expected to be. Um, so these things make it into the story. Uh, they, the, these documents also told me like about what subjects were studied in the schools and how the school year was arranged. Um, I also learned some things, things that not, didn't necessarily make it into the novel, but I found interesting anyway, um, like, um, like the things that someone could get arrested for in Worcester uh, in the 1850s, like playing cards on a Sunday or taking a girl to a house of ill fame or my personal favorite, larceny of fruit. If I could have figured out how to put that in the novel, I might have. Um, and about the, it also told me about the fact that Worcester streets have always been under construction and Worcester citizens have always complained about it. So some things just don't change. Um, I also learned about the great desire for Worcester citizens to have Hope Cemetery be their final resting place. So for anyone who's not familiar with the rural cemetery movement, it began in America in about 1831 when the first one, uh, Mount Auburn Cemetery in Boston was created. Cemeteries were starting to be designed as gardens or parks. And previously graveyards had been in churchyards or sometimes on the common, like uh, Worcester's first graves are on the, the common downtown. Um, anyway, those graveyards, especially in urban areas were overcrowded and very unsanitary. It's just not a place you'd wanna be hang out for very long. So this rural cemetery movement was, it was a movement towards creating places of beauty and places where people would spend time, go for a stroll, have a picnic, or just spend time at the grave of a loved one. So they actually became destinations for the living as well as the final destination for the deceased. They had named avenues and lined with shade trees and gardens and all sorts of landscaping and the artwork on the gravestones became more elaborate and symbolic. So at the time of Aaron's children, Hope Cemetery was being constructed and the committees overseeing it were required to submit an annual report to the city. So prior to the creation of Hope Cemetery, many people had plots reserved for them in an area known as Raccoon Plain, because just like today, you can go you know, pick out your plot and purchase it ahead of time. Um, so uh, by the way, Raccoon Plain was a level tract of land in South Worcester. It's over like um, Southgate, Camp and Cambridge Streets, like where St. John Cemetery is now. Um, so, but when people found out that Worcester was going to have one of these new types of cemeteries, everybody wanted a plot there. And many who'd already purchased their plot in Raccoon Plain wanted to sell it and buy one in Hope Cemetery. So here, I'm gonna give you a short reading from Erin's Children, where the Pratts, who are the employers of Kathleen O'Connor, um, she's a domestic servant and they're her employers, and she, they're talking about it here. Arthur, we simply must move our plots. Kathleen, who was polishing the lamps in the dining room, could easily overhear the conversation between Mr. and Mrs. Pratt. They'd been arguing all Sunday afternoon about their cemetery plots. Like many others in Worcester, they had purchased plots in Raccoon Plain. Now that the city had taken up the latest craze of creating burying grounds that resembled fancy parks, Mrs. Pratt insisted that eternity in Raccoon Plain was not appropriate. She wanted to be buried in the New Hope Cemetery with its glorious lawns, shady tree-lined avenues, and exquisite statuary. I don't see what difference it makes, said Mr. Pratt. Mrs. Pratt let out a loud huff. Everyone of quality is going to be buried in Hope Cemetery. I'll never rest easy if we're stuck in Raccoon Plain. Even the name sounds common. Do you think all the dead will be gathering for high tea underground? Kathleen could hear the exasperation in Mr. Pratt's voice. She focused hard on her polishing to keep from laughing out loud. Arthur, Mrs. Pratt's voice took on the tone of one speaking to a dull child. You simply do not understand. If you depart this life ahead of me, 
all our friends must follow the hearse to Raccoon Plain. I'll be mortified. So would you if the situation were reversed. What are we to do with the plots in Raccoon Plain? Sell them, I suppose. It's not as though we'll be able to enjoy our time in Hope Cemetery, you understand. Oh, Arthur, please. It's a beautiful sight. People spend afternoons strolling the avenues and families have picnics on the grounds. Really, Arthur, this is m as much from my family and friends as it is for me. I want a lovely, comfortable place for you all to visit me when I'm gone from the world. Truly, all for our benefit, Mr. Pratt asked. Kathleen quickly buried her face in the sleeve of her uniform to muffle a laugh. Why, of course, dear, and there's another thing one must consider. When the hev heavenly trumpet sounds and the dead are raised, do you really wish to have the Lord see you've been mired in some ungodly pit in Raccoon Plain? Are you aware, my dear, that Hope Cemetery has set aside a number of free plots for those who can't afford a burial anywhere? I've heard Mrs. Pratt's voice turned frosty. Those are on the outskirts. They'll not be near our kind. Her tone changed to one of begging. Oh, please, Arthur, you must exchange our plots for ones in Hope Cemetery. I'll be so embarrassed if you don't that I think, well, I think I'll be forced to live forever just to avoid being humiliated by my final resting place. Well, we can't have that. Kathleen wondered if Mr. Pratt meant he couldn't have Mrs. Pratt humiliated or living forever. She knew which one she'd choose. Good, now that that's settled, what have you heard about the new hotel going up on Main Street? What's it to be called? The Bay State House Hotel, Mr. Pratt said. They've moved a wing of the original eastward to make use of it as a carriage house. Good Yankee thrift, I say, nothing lost. No sense in throwing out what's perfectly serviceable. The Bay State House Hotel, Mrs. Pratt said, letting the name roll luxuriously off her tongue. I understand it's going to be quite elegant. Worcester is coming up in the world. Truly, Arthur, we must come up with it. That's just a little section about Hope Cemetery. Uh, I also came across a very interesting book. I can't even remember how I found out about this, but um, it's this one. It's called A Dictionary of Worcester, Massachusetts and Its Vicinity by Franklin Pierce Rice. And this handy dandy little guidebook was published in 1889. It is an alphabetical listing of places all over Worcester, and some of which were gone by the time the books was published, but they were still known to the city's inhabitants. So each item in the book gives a, a short description and history of the place, which helped me immensely in making sure that places I wanted to use had the right names and that they had actually been in existence in the 1850s. And I would suggest if anybody checks this book out that you use a magnifying glass because the type is tiny. And I also use, I don't know if I can show this to you or not, but I also used a map of Worcester from the 1870s. Um, kind of really hard to see, but uh, I tried to get one from the 1850s, but couldn't find one. So I figured this one was as close as I was gonna get. And using that in combination with the Worcester Dictionary worked very well. So of course, along with research on Worcester's history, I had to research the history of the time period in America in general, um, like both on the grand scale of what was going on politically, economically, and so on, as well as the everyday life, like food, fashion, social mores, customs, things like that. Hello. Um, because of my two main characters, Meg and Kathleen, our domestic servants, I needed a good understanding of what Irish domestic servants in New England did and what their lives were like. The best book I found on this subject is called The Irish Bridget, um, Irish Immigrant Women in Domestic Service in America, 1840 to 1930 by Margaret Lynch Brennan. By the way, Bridget is what Irish women, particularly domestic servants were collectively called by American Yankees. It's kind of the feminine version of Patty. Um, and this book was full of information about what Irish domestic servants did for work and what they did during their time off. And also explained the prejudice that they endured from a lot of the American Yankees. And I also found that I had to delve into the politics of the time, despite the fact that I am not particularly fond of politics, 
But what was going on politically at the time was very important for all of my characters because the Know Nothing Party had gained power and one of their main goals was to get rid of all the immigrants. So in Erin's Children, you will find characters with a variety of political leanings. And this also includes the abolitionist movement, which was very strong at the time, and it was strong in Worcester. And it's because remember, this is set in the decade just prior to the American Civil War. So it took about a year of research before I was comfortable enough to start writing, and then about another year to write the book. And, but the research didn't stop once I started writing. So even once I got going on that, I still had to stop every so often to find out something I needed to know for the story. So it just kept going right up until the end of the story uh, or to the end of the writing of it. But I am really glad that I decided to set Erin's children in Worcester. I've lived in this area almost my entire life and I knew some things about Worcester's history, but I was amazed at all the things I learned. And it certainly made driving around the city a new experience. I started seeing it in a whole new light. Now, of course, Erin's Children is historical fiction, um, though I always work hard to maintain historical accuracy. In a work of fiction, it's permissible and sometimes even necessary to alter a few things uh, when needed for the story. For example, in Erin's Children, um, Kathleen gets caught in a hurricane. In reality, uh, there was a storm that did occur in the late summer of 1851, but it was not actually a hurricane. It was a very severe storm and it did spawn a tornado. That tornado did rip through a section of Worcester and as depicted in the book, it did rip the roof off Quinsigmund Village School, but it wasn't a hurricane. It is in the story because it works better for me for that. Um, in some other instances, I used what I learned was real in Worcester in the 1850s and applied it to my story. For example, my um, creation of the Hendry and Cope's livery stable is completely fictional, but there was a real livery service on Exchange Street. Um, and that's kind of like the foundry where there was a real foundry, but I, I changed things to make it, you know, to, to use that and put in the story, but it's not the foundry that was there. There also is a brothel in the novel. And I know there were brothels in Worcester in the 1850s because they show up in the police records in the annual reports. But nowhere did I ever find the actual location of any. So the location in the novel is completely fictional as are the people that are in it. That's wholly, wholly fictional. Um, there are a few fires in the story. The Merrifield fire, as I've already mentioned, was real. And I tried to keep to the facts as much as I could, as I could find them. Um, there are, the other fires in the story are not based on any particular fires in the city. However, the annual reports of the fire department show numerous fires. And they also state towards the end of the 1850s that Worcester went from having a volunteer fire department to a professional one for that reason. And also the aqueduct in Worcester did supply the water from Bell Pond to the hydrants. I really enjoyed incorporating some of Worcester's history into my story, and I really hope I've done it justice. I'm just going to, um, before we open up to questions, I would like to um, just read a, a, another short section from Erin's Children. This, in this section, um, Meg and Kathleen, they're sisters, and they are on their Thursday, which is the uh, was the day off, the afternoon anyway, off for domestic servants. So they're going, they're, they're meeting at the, another friend's house who's also a domestic servant, Nula, um, and well, at the home of her employer. They all live in with their employers. And May has just recently received a letter from home, from Ireland, and uh, it has news of, of Megan Kathleen's brother, Brendan. And he was deported um, to Australia and no one's heard from him in years. They had no idea what's happened uh, to him. So when they, find, they finally get a letter that tells them they've heard from him, Kathleen knows that uh, uh, Meg has this letter. So she actually goes to meet her at Nula's house so she can hear what, what was said. And she gets caught in the, the hurricane on the way. So um, she does make it there, but this picks up where she, she's just gotten to the house. Meg's here, Nuala said, made it just before the last squall. She scurried to the pantry. Returning with towels, she handed one to Kathleen who rubbed her face and hair with it. 
The other she draped over Kathleen's shoulders. Take off your shoes and leave them by the door. Where's your bonnet? Did you lose it on the way? I didn't wear it. I knew it would get ruined. Nula looked aghast, then shrugged. You'll have to borrow one of mine when you leave. You can't be seen outside without a bonnet. As far as the Yankees are concerned, you might as well be walking about town in your undergarments. Kathleen had only a moment to consider yet another Yankee oddity before Nula whipped off the soaked towel from her shoulders, throwing it in a corner by the stove. Nula hurried her up the back staircase to the third floor and into her bedchamber at the far end of the hallway, where Meg was poring over Rory's letter. Tell me of Brendan, Kathleen burst out the moment she saw her sister. Meg rose. Kathleen, you're soaked to the skin, she said. There will be no reading until we get you dried off, Nula stated, as she commenced stripping off Kathleen's clothes. I can undress myself, Kathleen said, brushing away Nula's hand. What am I to wear? She asked as the sodden clothing landed with a flop on the floor. Nothing of mine will fit you, Nula observed. She looked about the room. I know, she said, opening the chest at the foot of the bed. Wrap yourself in this. She pulled out a woolen blanket. Nula gathered up the wet clothes. I'll hang these by the stove. With luck, they'll be dry by the time you go home. Kathleen sat on Nula's bed, feeling ill at ease, being naked beneath the blanket. She glanced at the bedchamber door. The Dentons won't come in, she asked Meg. We're in Nula's room and on our own time, Meg answered. You must insist on getting out of that kitchen. Kathleen glanced at the papers in Meg's lap. Two sheets? Meg nodded, lifted the pages. Rory shared lots of news. All about Brendan? Not all, Meg said. There's other news as well. Kathleen peered eagerly at Rory's letter, straining to see in the dim light. The storm continued to rage outside Nula's window. Only one candle burned in the room. Meg brought it close to where she and Kathleen sat on the bed. Hold this so I can see to read, Meg said. Kathleen reached out a bare arm from beneath the blanket. What's that, Meg asked. Bruises? How did you get them? Kathleen sighed. Lemuel, she said. Meg's eyes narrowed. What happened? I fetched him a cup of water, and when I turned away, he grabbed my arm to keep me from leaving. Seems he wanted a second drink, Kathleen said, not completely successful in keeping the anger from her voice. You need to find another place. It's not that bad, Meg, and I've not been there long. I can't leave yet. Kathleen thought of her desire to block the kitchen door with the chair last night, but she'd grown so fond of Clara she hated to leave her. Did you speak to Mrs. Pratt? Aye, she said she would talk to Lemuel. Mm, Meg muttered. You must make it clear that if anything of the sort happens again, you will leave immediately. Where would I go? To the Lintons at first. They'll get word to me. I'll set you up with the agency or ask Father Gilbert to help you find a placement. Promise me. Aye, she agreed, hoping Mrs. Pratt would convince Lemuel to leave her be. That storm is beyond any I've ever seen, Nuala said, flinging open the door. I brought more candles, like night it is outside. Look. Nothing was visible beyond the window pane. It's worse, Kathleen marveled. The window glass rattled. I stuck my head out the door, Nuala said. The trees are bending over, looking about to snap. She set the extra candles into holders and lit them. I wonder how long it will last, Meg said. Nuala shrugged. Mrs. Denton says it's likely to be bad for some time and you aren't to venture out into anything as wild as this. A bolt of lightning flashed, cutting through the curtain of rain and momentarily lighting up Nula's bedchamber. Within seconds, two sharp cracks pierced the air followed by an ear-splitting explosion of thunder. In the candlelight, Kathleen noticed a broad grin on Nula's face. You enjoy a storm, do you? She asked. Aye, right exciting it is, said Nula. Now Meg, on to your letter. With Kathleen and Nula holding candles on either side of Meg, she unfolded the pages. But thank you for, um, for listening. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. That was great, Eileen. Thank you. The research you did is very impressive. Thank you. It was fun to learn about Worcester. Um, before we get into any questions, there's some questions here in the chat. Would you be able to hold up the books again that you used for research? Sure. Um, I could type those titles into the chat. Um, there is Inventing Irish America. You can see that.
and that's by Timothy J. M E A G H E R. Perfect. There is uh, also by the same author is um, to preserve the flame. That's the one that's the history of St. John's Church. Thank you. Uh, this is the Dictionary of Worcester, Massachusetts and its vicinity. That's Franklin Pierce Rice. And there was Irish Bridget as well. The Irish Bridget, yep. That's Margaret Lynch Brennan. I did use other um, other books as well. Those were the ones that uh, that were I think I used probably the most of. And then when there was one on the know nothings, so I have to go look it up. But yeah, um, no, that's that's great. Thank you for that. I'm gonna put sure. that into chat, everyone. There's the titles and the authors. All right, let me go back to our questions here. Okay, uh, so Philomena asks, did the story and plot arise from the history you studied or did you have a storyline before you studied the lo local history? Um, well, when I was writing Kelligine, I was getting uh, towards the end of it. And at that time, ideas for um, a life in America for them started popping up into my head. So I hadn't even done any yet, um, but I just had, um, it was like, you know, nascent ideas. I didn't have any total plot lined out or anything. I just had some ideas floating around. Um, so I purposely ended uh, Caligine where it would be obvious that there would, a sequel was needed. And so then when I started doing the research for it, um, I think the plot started to really come to me more thoroughly because as I'd go through the research, I'd be like, oh, wow, that would be great in the book. And this would be, this would work for this character and things like that. So it's kind of both. Um, but I actually did, did have the idea of doing it uh, before I started researching. Great, thank you. All right, let's go back. Um, so Allison has a question. What historic facts did you have to delete from the story for length or too much detail that you really wished you could have included? Well, that's a really good question. Um, a lot of times after, you know, after you're, you, you do it, you have to do all this research and you've got this mountain of research and then you have to pick and choose. Um, it's like what goes with the story. Um, then afterwards, it's sometimes the everything else has kind of vanished from your mind. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's a, I'd really have to, I'd probably have to go look through the notes again and say, oh yeah, that would have been really neat. You <laughs> know, um, like maybe the larceny of fruit that would have been fun if I could figure out what that is. And <laughs> um, yeah, like a lot of the things that people could get arrested for, nobody gets arrested in my book. So uh, that 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 might have been interesting. Um, um, there was a lot of things about schools. Um, people who were uh, apprentices, um, young men who were apprentices, and they were working a lot. There were some schools that, that they could go to in Worcester that were actually like evening schools because they were working during the day and they couldn't go and they, they needed to or wanted to further their education, they could go to some of these schools. Um, and uh, that, that was kind of interesting that they were doing that like night school back then. <laughs> So there was a, you know, a few things like that, but again, I think I'd have to go through all the research again and look at it and say, oh yeah, that would have been interesting, but there wouldn't, wasn't anywhere to put in the book. All right, just working on the chat here. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Uh, 
Um, Allison said she is also guessing you use the Sanford fire insurance maps. Did you use those, Eileen? Um, I don't know. I, I just used the records. So I, it's probably the same information. But that would have been interesting to, to have seen, I'm sure. And Allison would also like to know about the writing workshop you were in. Um, well, I've been in a couple uh, years and years ago when I was working on Caligeen, I was in the Worcester Writing Workshop. I, as far as I know, I don't think it's still operating, but that was a long time ago, um, where we used to meet, Cynthia Kennison ran that workshop, and um, we'd meet, I think it was once a week, and write and um, critique each other's work. And I was in that for several years, and I, I think that my writing really improved a lot from that workshop. I highly recommend if you can find a good workshop, I recommend them. Um, and then when I was working on Aaron's Children, I was really missing. I'd been years since I'd been in a workshop, and I was really missing it. And I knew a few other people who were writers in the area, so I decided to start one. So the one that I'm in now actually meets at my home, and um, it's a good group, excellent group of writers that are there. And um, Another local writer some people might be familiar with is Jane Willen. She writes um, histor uh, not historical, but um, cozy mysteries. And she's in the group and um, she lives in Paxton. She's a wonderful, wonderful writer. And a lot of other people who not yet published, but I'm sure they will be because they're all great writers. Um, so we meet every week in my house. And uh, well, we couldn't during COVID, but um, otherwise we do and we write and, and again, critique each other's work and it's, it's wonderful. Thank you, Eileen, and thank you for those great, uh, great questions, Allison. We do have um, the Sanborn maps here at Worcester Public Library. Uh, let's see, Cindy would like to know how much time uh, per day or week do you spend on research? Um, it's kind of hard to say because I don't, I work a full-time job, so I don't, you know, sit down at a certain time every day and work on it or, you know, uh, it's where I can find time. Um, so when I'm in the research phase, an awful lot of my evenings and weekends are spent on research. It's kind of where I can get the time. Um, like I said, it took me about a year to get through enough research to feel comfortable starting to write. Um, you know, uh, I would, did go to, to, like I said, I went to the Historical Museum, um, a few other places in the city. And the so like those are considered research too, not just reading the books and taking notes. So, uh, you know, it's it's um, it's hard to say. Like I can't put an exact number of hours or anything on a day or a week because it varied so much. But pretty much every free moment I could get. Thank you. Uh, Philomena wants to know what would you like your readers to take away from your two novels. Um. Well, I think that when you read a novel, something hopefully um, speaks to you. So everybody's probably gonna take something different away from it. Um, I think with these novels, they have a lot to do with, well, the first one was with the, the tragedy of the great hunger in, in Ireland. And it being the, the reason, the impetus why so many of the Irish came to America. And then Aaron's Children, which picks up where that left off at, at their experience here. And um, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot about the immigrant experience. Um, in this case, it's Irish immigrants from the 19th century, but you know, this is this, this country's uh, has uh, has had immigrants come from the nearly the beginning and well the, I should say the beginning because the beginning is the Native Americans and then but um, but the beginning of of the European settlement and then you know it, it they always have a tough time at first and um, I think that just think but that's what who built this country in a lot of ways so I, I just think that it has to do with the experience and they are, uh, you know, the, um, all that they went through and all that they brought to this country. And so everyone who comes to this country from somewhere brings something with them that's, that's wonderful and that helps and that, you know, I just think that we should appreciate more. 
All right, we got some more coming in here. Uh, Jody would like to know, do you have a new idea for your next book? Will you have a trilogy? And she says, thank you for your talk. Well, you're very welcome. Um, I am working on another historical fiction novel right now. It has, it's completely different, has nothing to do with uh, these two. Um, as far as a third for this series, I probably will write one. Um, I'm not sure when, but I think I will. And I think that it would be focused on uh, this, the next generation. So post-Civil War and probably the children of these characters. Very interesting, thank you. All right. Um, so Jess would like to know, in your research, did you find that the Irish communities in Worcester were also favorable of the abolitionist cause? I know in other parts of the North, there was an active support for it from the Irish, but she wasn't sure if that varied regionally. Um, I didn't find too much about it, about the Irish in Worcester, but in general, um, the Irish were not really terribly interested in it. Um, they were dealing with their own issues. So um, it, was, it was, you know, hard for them to be thinking about some, that as well. Uh, and also they were looking at if, uh, if, slavery was abolished, a lot of people who had been slaves would be coming north and then they would be competition for, for jobs for them. So um, not saying, I don't think that they thought that, you know, slavery was okay or good or moral or anything like that, but they had a different, um, a different perspective than say the Yankee abolitionists did because they're looking at this from a whole different uh, viewpoint. Um, so yeah, I don't think they had a lot of support for it. Uh, in fact, they really, really wanted a Democrat president uh, because the Democrat presidents were, or the Democrat politicians were generally not abolitionists, but they were the ones who were also not willing to uh, deport the, the immigrants. They wanted to keep them because they were their voting block, a big vo voting block for them. And um, so the, their opponents say the know nothings and others uh, that the new the Republican Party, which became new during the 1850s, they, that was when it was um, created. Uh, they were strong abolitionists, but they were also um, nativists. They they wanted to um, get rid, they, they wanted to send the uh, immigrants back. Um, and by the way, that though they were abolitionists, I shouldn't say they were abolitionists. They were anti-slavery, and those actually are two different things to a degree. Um, they. Um, they wanted to get rid of slavery, but they wanted it because then they wanted to take the, the, the people who'd been slaves and move them to back to Africa or wherever, um, you know, where, anywhere that wasn't here because they were what nativists, they felt that this country was to be white only and basically uh, Northern European, particularly British only. <laughs> and that's what they thought it should be. So that's why they wanted to, you know, have everybody who wasn't just like them gone. That was an interesting question, Jess. Thank you. Uh, Cindy would like to know about the house you toured in Worcester. So that was owned by a gentleman who lives in the house and it's in Crown Hill. And um, he uh, was a very generous man who, who uh, gave Cindy and I a full tour of his house. It's beautiful, beautiful house in the Crown Hill area. And um, I made it to be uh, Hiram Archer's house in the novel. So it's just, um, it's still kept very much, even on the inside, uh, as it was in the 1850s when it was built. And uh, it has um, these you know, beautiful, like the, the fireplaces. And like a lot, what he would tell us about the fireplaces is a lot of it looked like there was marble work there, but it, it, some of them are, weren't actually marble, even though they looked like it, it was painted to look like marble. And then there was like the ga the the fixtures of the um, the lit the lights overhead. I mean, he has electricity in there too, but he still has what was would have been the gas lamps. And there's one um, I think he's in the dining room where there's an extra gas jet. And what they would do is they would attach like a hose to it, and it would come down, and there'd be 
a gas lamp on, on the table, the centerpiece, and attach it to there, and that would light up the, the gas. And I, I mean, personally, to me, I would think like this hose hanging down from the lamp into your table is not the most attractive thing. But at the time, this was like a brand new thing to have, you know, gas lights. So that was really amazing for them. So, um, and that will get into the novel too, because um, some certain, the, the, the character working for him is not so crazy, but he's a little nervous about that. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, um, Philomena recommends the Crown Hill tour offered by Preservation Worcester. So if anybody's looking for something to do, you could check that out. Uh, I should you know, say too, excuse me, I should say too that in October, um, Cindy will be doing a tour for some people who, um, that were in a, um, well, I'm going with them. It, it, it's a, a walking to a Crown Hill rocking tour, but based on Erin's children. And so um, I have to look up the date. I know it's in October, but um, I don't think it's full yet. Um, I will be having something on my website about it. So if you go to my website and the events and media page, um, I will be putting something up. So if anybody's interested in joining us, I know there's going to be a limit, but um, you know, until we reach the limit, that's, you know, people could join in. Um, and then you can get to go on the, on the walking tour. Thank you. Um, Philomena here has a question about uh, the Catholic Church. Um, quick side note, I just put in Eileen's website again in the chat. So Philomena asks, uh, do you discuss the role of the Catholic Church uh, in this novel? She understands that many Protestants in Massachusetts um, thought that the Catholic Irish were a kind of invasion of the Papists. Yeah. Um, well, that's that's a big thing in the novel where because Megan, Kathleen, and Nula are, are Irish Catholics, um, and yeah, there's a there there is a, a lot that that was the main reason why they didn't want the Irish, uh, the the natives didn't want the Irish there because they were Catholic. Um, and yeah, they did. They talked about, there was a, I guess you could call it a conspiracy theory that at the foot at the time, that not just in Worcester, but all around that uh, they thought that the, the Pope was try, gonna try to take over the world and try to take over America. And, you know, and so um, that will come up in the novel where the, the family that Kathleen is working for, uh, the eldest son is a very nativist. He's he a know nothing. And, uh, and the family's rather, you know, very, very anti-Catholic, even though they, but they want a servant because having a servant shows that you, um, you know, you're coming up in the world. And middle class was new and they, they referred to it as um, middling or the middling sort, but it was, so one of the ways to show that you, um, you, you were had money, that you were, you know, coming into a, a place of prominence was to have servants. And so a lot of people of the middling sort um, could afford, they couldn't fire, afford to hire a whole fleet of servants, but they could have one, maybe two. And domestic servants at that time were almost entirely Irish Catholics because they were the immigrants, they were coming in, they would take this work, they get free room and board, um, plus their pay, so that's a good deal for them. And um, the Yankee women, uh, young women, uh, mostly single, of course, because that's what the, the uh, domestic servants were because they lived in with the family, so they usually were single. Um, the Yankee women th thought that was beneath them. They weren't gonna be anybody's servant. So if you wanted one, that's who you got, you know? So, so they, she wanted one, so she got a servant, but she was not thrilled that she has this uh, uh, you know, Irish Catholic girl living in her house. Allison would like to know where we can find copies of your books for sale locally, anywhere in the area. Um, I, yes, um, let's see. I, I know Boucher's Good Books um, has it, um, Lake Ave, I think. Um, I think Root and Press has them. I'm not sure, but I think they do. You can ask them. Um, yeah, there was another one. Oh, and uh, someone told me they picked them up at Barnes and Noble, I want to say the one in, is it Milbury? I think Milbury. Yep. Um, and of course, you can always get them like um, on Amazon and, um, you know, like barnesandnoble.com and Kobo and Smashwords and all those. Thank you. Uh, Jane would like to know who was your favorite character to write? And she also loves your website. Thank you. Um, oh, wow, I love all my characters, but I think 
I think in this, in Erin's children, I think it was Kathleen. Um, in, in her sister, Meg, who's very, also very prominent in, in Erin's children, was one of the, the main, one of the primary characters in um, Annette Kelligine. And of course, she's the one that comes to America and then starts bringing others over. But um, so she was fun. But I think Kathleen, who was kind of secondary in the first book, really took on a life of her own in this book. She became a, a point of view character, um, a main character, and um, which I was planning from the start. But her personality really started to come out and really shine in this book. So she was she was um, she was a lot of fun to her. And she's the one that runs into all the, the problems. <laughs> so she has to um, really show her metal. <laughs> Great. Okay, so does anyone have any other questions for Eileen? No? Okay. All right, perfect. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, that was a great discussion. You all asked really great questions. Um, if any of you uh, need the resources that Eileen gave to us. Um, I have the four titles written down. Um, just reach out to the library. We can email them to you. And thanks for joining us. Like I said, you can take our survey. You can check out our new programming page uh, for fall programming. It'll be up there soon. And if that is it, We'll see everybody later. Thank you, Eileen. Can't Thank wait you. for the third book in your trilogy, maybe. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Stay safe. And thank, thank you, you everyone. Thank you, Tara.